We are so happy to have you today with us, Caroline Anna Cox, the Baronet. So, welcome to South Sudan. Thank you, and I'm very happy to be with you, and I'm very happy to be back in South Sudan, because I think, as you know, I've been many, many times, many of them during the bitter war from 89 to 2005. I think they all know about you and your relation with South Sudan and the struggle in South Sudan. Mm -hmm. So, for those who don't know you, could you introduce yourself? Certainly. Um, I have a title called Baroness, Baroness Cox, or Barona Cox. Yeah. And uh, when it has that title because one is appointed to the House of Lords, which is like a Senate in the British Parliament. Um, I always say I'm a nurse and a social scientist by intention, a baroness by astonishment, because I was not into politics. I was the first baroness I'd ever met. But it's a privilege to speak in the British Parliament. So I thought, how do I use the privilege? And the message came very clearly that to speak in the British Parliament is a wonderful place to be a voice for those whose voices <coughs> are not heard. And so that is how I use my role in the House of Lords. And it's one of the reasons I was in your country many, many times during the previous war, all over, everywhere, in East and Upper Nile, in well, Equatoria, in Barra Ghazal, all over, and had a particular opportunity to spend some of that time rescuing the women and children who'd been taken into slavery by the government of Sudan and by the Mujahideen and the Murhaleen. Yeah. And so it was many, many times up in that area, in Barra Ghazal and Twitch, uh, and uh, rescuing slaves. I was also in many other parts of Sudan and my tears were flowing for your people. They were suffering so much in those terrible days so my tears fell on your soil as I wept at the suffering of your people. Okay. Uh, like uh, if someone want to talk about history of South Sudan do one of the elements in this history and you have strong relation, especially with the founder of uh, South Sudan or the revolution in South Sudan, Victor Chongre. So mm -hmm. could you tell us the relation with you, you and Chongre? Well, it was a great privilege uh, to know John Garang and so many of the people who fought alongside him. I met him many times, had a great respect for him for, and for his army who fought so hard and paid a very high price for uh, the peace which you now have. And um, it was a great tragedy, I think, when he was killed in that crash, the plane crash. And I grieved again with many other people who grieved at his death. But I have a great respect for the people of South Sudan, how you're moving forward in spite of terrible suffering, in spite of impossible odds, fighting against the regime in Khartoum. And uh, I would always say that we who live in freedom owe a debt of gratitude uh, to the people of South Sudan because you held a front line of faith and freedom for the rest of the world. And we should say thank you to you for the price you paid for the freedom you have, but for a freedom which is part of freedom of the people who want freedom throughout the world. So thank you. Of course. Well, we were in Abyei because uh, there is a lot of suffering in Abyei. And we were trying to help some of the orphans and people who'd suffered from the floods. And so we were helping to provide uh, food and mosquito nets. But while we were there, one morning, three or four, four or five days ago, uh, we woke up to the terrible news of a massacre at Cologne. And we went immediately with the governor uh, to witness the suffering of the people and we arrived very soon after the massacre had been carried out. The Tukuls were still burning, the burnt bodies were inside the huts, and uh, there was already a grave with many of the bodies of the people who'd been killed, including a child, and it was a heartbreak scene. There were the, obviously, the corpses, the, there were those who were grieving the wounded, and one of the most heartbreaking uh, was the fact that many children were abducted between the age of two and 12. And I think that is a terrible thing because if you lose someone, they're killed, that is 
terrible, terrible, terrible. But if your child is taken and you don't know what has happened and what is happening to them in abduction into slavery, then that is no closure. You know, you've just spent all the time worrying. And when I was up in Abyei, staying in the UN compound, um, I met a, a young man there yeah. and he came to me and said, thank you so much. Uh, when I was a slave, I was taken as a little boy age five, but you rescued me. And he told us his story, how much he'd suffered. And so I think the abduction is a terrible part of the massacre, as well as the death and the injury and the bereavement. And you now, as a one of the international body humanitarian uh, organization, so what you will tell the world about your visit to South Sudan? Well, I think just to remain in Abye for the moment, um, we, there is enormous need for help. And with the status, the political status of Abye, it's very hard for the big, in fact, they don't go, the big aid organizations. So there is a lot of need there, which needs a lot more help than they can get because the big aid organizations will not go for political reasons. So I'd say one problem is to get enough humanitarian aid to the people, and that is food and medicine, but also education, the important things, healthcare. Um, but the other thing was a very worrying uh, thing which we were told when we were at Cologne, where the massacre was, that they said that the UN MINISFA, the, the UN body responsible for protection of the people of Abbey, uh, had been there the night, the day before, and the people were worried because they'd seen many Arabs around and they wanted to flee. But the UN security forces said, no, don't go. We can't protect you if you run into the bush. Stay where you are. And then they left. And before any other people came to replace them, the massacre took place. So if they had run, as they felt they wanted to do, they would probably have been saved, many or most of them. But because they stayed, because they were told to stay, then they suffered so much. So that is a big question which needs, I think, serious investigation and a report as to why that was the municipal policy. OK, uh, let us back on, uh, on a day uh, when South Sudan is struggling for their freedom. Yes. And your name and your organization have been in the media of Sudan regime that time that you are, the, you are helping the rebel and uh, you're one of the organizations that want to destroy Sudan. So what's what your reaction about <laughs> that time? <laughs> Well, in those days when we were rescuing the slaves, that was um, way back in the uh, 90s, and I was working then with the CSI Christian Solidarity International. I mean, so we received a lot of criticism for rescuing slaves from Anti-Slavery International, from other people, which I think was not correct. They said that rescuing slaves was just encouraging slave trade. Well, that was not accurate. That slave trade was a weapon of war it would have gone on whether we'd rescued any slaves or not. That was going to happen. And you can't leave people in slavery if you can free some of them. So that criticism was not correct. The other criticism was that, uh, well, we were just going to you know, release them and they'd be recaptured and taken back again. So it was the wrong thing to do. Well, that was wrong because many of the people whom we had actually saved from slavery, uh, we met them years later, they were still free. They were not recaptured. And we have many of those stories in a book which I wrote about slavery. And so it was right to rescue slaves, I believe. I wish we could have rescued thousands instead of hundreds because there were many thousands who were taken. So we have many of the memories of those days. I think the worrying thing now is that slavery is still going on. Yeah. And I think there is, should be a real pressure on the new government in Khartoum to watch what's happening and to stop that slavery or the misery of the people in the Abye area. It's going on, it's not reported, and I think the world needs to know and the world needs to put pressure on the new government, which is doing some good things in Khartoum, uh, to stop slavery. My personal opinion is I would hope that the referendum which was taken uh, a little bit back and which had a massive majority in favor of Abyei becoming part of South Sudan, that should be honored. 
because the, it was over 90% of those who voted wanted Abyei to become part of South Sudan. Uh, it was not recognized because the Misaria were not included in the referendum. But that, I think, would not be a good argument because the Misaria are not civilians living in Abyei. I mean, they're tribal herdsmen. They come and they go and they have done for centuries. But they're not residents. They're not living in uh, Abyei. And I think the, those who voted who are living in Abyei, their, their voice should be taken seriously and their decision should be honored. And I would hope that perhaps the British government might encourage the new regime, or not regime, the new yeah. government yeah, no, in no. Uh, Khartoum, mm -hmm. the new government in Khartoum, to honor that referendum and to re remove forever this problem of the location of Abyei, because it puts it in a terrible situation. You can't get humanitarian aid there. Uh, the killings are going on, like the terrible massacre we witnessed last week. Um, and I think the rights of the people of Abyei, which they exercised in the referendum, should be recognized, and that could bring peace to Abyei and the people who live in that area. The Misaria can still come, as they have done for centuries, with their cattle. That's, you know, that, that is time-honored tradition. Yes. But I think the referendum should be acknowledged and the rights of the people of Abyei should be respected and that was to stop the ambiguous status of Abyei and recognize it as part of South Sudan. Okay. And after you visit Abyei and we see all these terrible things, mm -hmm. what, what, uh, what the future will look like? I mean, how will you read the future? Well, I go with grief because you, it is heartbreaking to see what happened. We'll go to the British government and raise these issues with the British government and particularly um, better protection for the people of Abyei as it now is because that was not the only massacre. There have been many smaller ones with the Missouria and it looks like a policy of ethnic cleansing or land grab, we say. Yeah. They dry the people off the land and then they move in. But that is land grab, that is ethnic cleansing and that needs to be taken seriously. So I shall try to raise this with the British government uh, to work with uh, the transitional government in Khartoum to try to develop a policy of protection for the people of Abyei, recognition of their right uh, to become part of South Sudan, if that is what they still want, and, and also to ensure humanitarian aid reaches people in desperate need, especially after the flooding. And there's virtually no food, they've lost their crops. Their need is terrific, and that ought to be honored and respected by the transitional government in Khartoum with help from the international community, including Britain, uh, to help the people of Abyei in ways that respect their rights. Okay. And uh, lastly, uh, what is your message to people of South Sudan, those now living in well, my message crisis, war? I know. Yeah. And now they're going for peace. What yes. is your message? My message to people of South Sudan is congratulations on what you have achieved with the CPA, the peace agreement, your independence. Yes, I know you have suffered and are suffering very, very seriously. I hope and pray that there will be a resolution, uh, a political resolution, a peace agreement amongst the political leaders. I hope and pray that the United Army, which brings together different factions, into the United Army that will develop and that will help to bring about uh, responsible military uh, occupation and, and activities and operations. And I hope and pray that you will get the freedom, the justice, the democracy you deserve. And I have great respect wherever we go in South Sudan, we see local people working very, very hard uh, in very difficult situations, that their work will be respected and honored, and that there will be a freedom, and there is such potential amongst your young people. And as I was here during the previous war, I know two generations of young people could not go to school because of constant aerial bombardment, that the first thing little children would learn to hear is the difference between Antonov and the Hercules. The Antonov, they would run, the Hercules bringing food, 
was good news. But that's a terrible thing for little children to learn, and they couldn't go to school. So I hope there will be a big encouragement and resources from the international community to help to develop education for your generations who could not have it, help to provide professional training. I think when South Sudan first got its independence, I was told there were only eight midwives for the whole of South Sudan. There needs to be a tremendous investment in training of nurses, midwives, healthcare workers, doctors too, of course, and that South Sudan will be enabled to develop its future, which it deserves. You are a great people, people of great courage, great dignity, great generosity, great resourcefulness. You're still here after all those years of suffering. You're still here and you still smile. And I finished one of my speeches on the tragedies in South Sudan in the House of Lords, paying tribute to the dignity of people of South Sudan. And my final words were, and your courageous South Sudanese smiles. You are a very, very great people. I have great respect for you. And I just hope and pray that you will have help, all the help you need from obviously your own people, from Khartoum and the international community to develop your future, which you deserve. Okay, at the end of our program, the open mic, we want to thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, we hope we meet again. I hope so too, inshallah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.